by my production assistant. It's very affordable and very bad his job. But, uh, you know, that's how, that's how it goes. Uh, Kentucky Fried Comrades here, everybody. Hey there, long time no see, but. Of course, uh, Kentucky Fried Comrade is a professional fast food Robin Hood. Uh, he's worked at several different uh, Wendy's, Burger King's, McDonald's in the Washington, D.C. area, making sure to get the order wrong of every conservative and Republican verified customer that he can find. And uh, if uh, he can't verify and just has a feeling, then, uh, you know, he'll probably get shorted wrong anyway, just to be safe. Cause that's I mean, what... statistically statistically speaking, even if it's a Democrat, it's probably worth it to get. I that. mean, in D.C., yeah, if, even if they're a Democrat, there's a better 50-50 shot there. Still a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're not here to talk about any uh, Republicans, Democrats. No, we're here to talk about another... Uh, and their fellow Democratic Socialist, uh, George Orwell. Uh, I think we were talking before, um, you know, when I was forming my politics uh, as an early teenager, I uh, always thought that the, the only real story worth telling uh, in history and politics is you know, the story of the people who do uh, all or nearly all of the actual work of making the world go. And uh, the small minority of everyone else who doesn't do that <laughs> and orders the rest of them about. Um, this is the fundamental dynamic worth exploring. Uh, and I think George Orwell saw the world that way too. And I think that's why he's uh, it's kind of inspirational for a lot of, of socialists, uh, don't you think? Oh, yeah. For me specifically, uh, growing up, he kind of embodied... A, a lot of different aspects of, of uh, life that I, I just found really both exciting and inspirational. Uh, and he did it, uh, did a lot of it almost accidentally. Uh, he was an author, a journalist. He took part in the Spanish Civil War, revolution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he, you know, began a, a tr uh, uh, a type of journalism that we would now basically call gonzo journalism, where he wanted to understand poverty more and he just dove in and, and lived it for a while. And I always found something inspirational about that. And growing up, realizing I wasn't a very smart person and was never going to really finish college, this was a figure I could look at and be like, this guy did all of this and influenced so much of the world. And he did it, a lot of it almost accidentally. Yeah. Uh, he also did not finish college, so if you were out there, you didn't finish college, uh, you and George Orwell got that in common. But uh, George Orwell, uh, real name Eric Arthur Blair, uh, novelist, journalist, essayist, democratic socialist, political philosopher, probably best known for two novels, Animal Farm and 1984. We'll talk a little bit about these as well as a lot of his journalism and essays. Uh, it was born uh, not in the United Kingdom, uh, but in Modihari, Bihar. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm doing my best. Eastern, that's in the eastern part of India. It was then ruled by the British Empire, of course. His pedigree was pretty good, but the family had kind of fallen a bit since their height. Uh, their downly mobile set, you'd say. He would describe their family class as lower upper class. Uh, his great-grandfather had been wealthy enough to be an absentee landlord of a sugar plantation in Jamaica. Uh, but his father, Richard, in those days, worked at the opium department in the Indian Civil Service, which was, uh, you know, a real job that he had to do, for sure. But uh, also not a terribly difficult one, and one that remunerated fairly well. Um, I don't know if you know anything about... How I should pronounce Modihari Bihar? <laughs> Kitty. <laughs> I I could not even hope to to be. Honest. I think it would actually be offensive if I tried to. I, just, I don't know. I did my best. But uh, when when he was one years old, <laughs> his uh, mother Ida was, uh, was a French descent. Uh, took him and his two sisters back to England, uh, 
So young Eric saw his father uh, briefly again after that when he was four for a visit, but otherwise uh, he wouldn't see him uh, in his life until he was about nine years old. Very British. <laughs> so and uh, after some primary school education at the hands of some exiled nuns from France and England, he was shipped off to boarding school, uh, which he re later report hating the shit out of really badly in an essay that... Um, he couldn't publish for many years in Britain. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a lot about libel laws, I know, right, Kenny? Yeah, it's a running theme in a lot of his work that the originals were never published because uh, dude named... Oh, you cut out a little bit. Oh, it just turns out that uh, a lot of first drafts of his never got published because he would name names in a lot of instances and uh you weren't really allowed to do yeah a lot of them never didn't come out until uh they were after his death even i think um and he always had trouble finding publishers uh he did describe uh in a famous essay hating the shit out of boarding school and would say the same in like interviews or whatever but uh, he did have a childhood friend and crush, Jacintha Budicum, who he'd reconnect with late in his life. Uh, she would recall his childhood slightly differently, uh, describing Orwell as a pretty happy child, actually. He, he didn't really see that the hands of bullies so much, wasn't nearly as obsessed with uh, a disdain, disdain for inequity or domination. Uh, kind of aloof, but also self-sufficient. No need for a wide circle of, of friends. Uh, that kind of naturally clever child, I think. Um, he did one... Very British. Yeah, extremely British. <laughs> he, did a, he did one term at, uh, at what we would consider a high school, probably, uh, in our time, uh, before he went to Eton, where notably he learned a little bit of French there from Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World. But his grades at Eton were not good, uh, probably from neglect and lack of discipline rather than ability. And because his family was not that well off, he could not attend university uh, without a scholarship, which he definitely was not going to qualify for. So instead of doing all that, he began cramming for the entry examination into the Imperial Police, uh, which would later become the more descriptively named Indian Police Service. And this is really the first, like, real job uh, George Orwell is probably going to hold. Uh, he did some college papers or whatever, but this is, this is the beginning of uh, his adult career and also his career in journalism, because what he's about to witness in India will affect him greatly. Uh, you got anything to add? Oh, I missed the bedwetting uh, that he that he participated in. Did you want to? Do you want to be my bedwetting correspondent? Yeah, I've got a lot to say about this uh, bedwetting situation. Uh, one of the things I actually like. One of the things I love about Orwell is, um, and I'll have some critical things to say about him later on as we get to his later life. But me too. He doesn't really. He does a really good job at capturing uh, both kind of some really gross aspects of life, but being able to twist something interesting out of them. And so he described uh, at certain points in, in his life uh, having this problem where he was consistently wetting the bed while in, in boarding school. And he described it as the first time he began to realize he could be punished for something that he had no control over. And I think it actually dovetails pretty nicely into his time as uh, basically a colonial police officer in India, uh, as he starts to see the real mix of colonialism on the native people there. Uh, I think that wetting the bed is like being black. It's exactly the same. You can't help it. And we shouldn't look down on people for wetting the bed or for being black. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, very similar, very similar thing. They're exactly, they're not similar, they're the same. No, I'm <laughs> um, Eric Blair chose a posting in Burma, of course, where his mother's mother lived. 
And after a short stint in trading, he began a career being posted here and there in India. Uh, for a man barely out of his teens, he was given pretty considerable authority and responsibility and power over a great many souls. As an imperial policeman, he would witness the events uh, It would be recalled in one of his better-known essays, just called A Hanging, as well as Shooting an Elephant and the novel Burmese Days. Uh, but uh, he'll also begin a lifelong career of uh, something else in 1927, which is uh, getting almost deathly ill and almost dying, which happens <laughs> like, a lot, <laughs> like over and over and over again. Partly it's just the time that he lived in. Partly it's that uh, he hated doctors and avoided them. Uh, <laughs> and partly it's said uh, he never really took good care of himself. He ate like shit. He drank, he smoked all the time. But uh... and put himself into uh, intentionally precarious situations. Oh yeah, we'll, also worth... no, we'll come to that. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, and it's worth noting um, one of the things he ended up being diagnosed with was TB, and that was fairly common at the time. But uh, it wasn't simply just a fear of doctors as doctors, but you would normally be quarantined if you were diagnosed with TB. Yeah, and he will, uh, he'll begin hiding it in 1947, actually, uh, just to jump ahead a little bit. But for now, 20 years before that, 27, he caught dengue fever. It was entitled for a long leave in England that year anyway. Uh, so when he took it early, he reassessed his life and resigned his police commission. Uh, he basically went and visited some uh, old mentors and tutors that he used to know and uh, learn after learning that his poetry was incredibly weak sauce he consciously began imitating American author Jack London and began exploring the experiences and lifestyles of the poor and poorer still uh, he did this at quite a lot of places but uh, just briefly he lived as uh, a tramp a beggar a dishwasher in Paris he took the opportunity of a hospital stay to experience and write about medical care for the poor. Uh, after recovering from that illness and hospital stay, he finally left Paris, went back to his house in England, which would be his base, uh, if not his home, for the next five years as he uh, basically continued uh, to do this shit for the better part of a decade. Uh, I have a little bit more to say about him uh living in and around the various elements of underclass of the world but uh how do you how do you feel about uh this uh radical turn towards gonzo journalism in the 1920s he takes uh yeah so it's kind of interesting uh looking at at some of this stuff now it's been a while for me but uh one of the interesting things and i want to tie this because I think there's a good through line here. Uh, Burmese Days, which is uh, technically his first book. It was the first book he wrote, but it was the second book that got published. Um, Burmese Days was, uh, as you noted earlier, about his time as an imperial police officer. And I will say as a novel, it's actually a very not great novel, but it is starting, it is the beginning of him formulating uh, a kind of reaction to, to his time as a colonial officer. And what's interesting about it is that he starts to see and he describes in really, uh, frankly, blunt terms what colonial police officers were doing to the native Burmese people. And this included, you know, sexual exploitation, economic exploitation, beatings. Uh, you brought up his essay about uh, the hanging he witnessed. And a lot of this all started to percolate together in his mind about, you know, these are regular people just like us, and we are doing some of the most horrific things to them. And it is, it is our jobs to do horrific things to them. And he starts to kind of develop the beginnings of a critique against that. He doesn't really have a, uh, a theoretical apparatus around it, like, uh, like, you know, maybe a Marxist, Marxist or anarchist critique. He just has a kind of base moral reaction against it. I was thinking about this a lot because um, he, he produces this kind of journalism a ton and it was incredibly popular like in the moment that it was written so much so that it was like it was translated across 
languages, and you know, he he would eventually become like you know, just quite in demand as a voice uh, in uh, the literary scene of not just Europe but all like really the entire world. But um, I think mean, the more I thought about it, like the more I think that kind of cuts both ways. I I would never accuse Orwell of uh, like consciously producing this or like uh wanting it to be read this way but uh it's a lot of poverty porn in some ways and uh the fact that it was so popular speaks to you know the huge degree to which uh gawking at and uh commiserating uh over the sufferings of the un- various underclasses of imperial england you know um it was it's kind of gross in a way i think um but oh it certainly is and uh i've heard people make that critique of him and i think it's actually a pretty fair one in a lot of ways uh even in uh down and out in paris and london which is uh, my favorite book of his uh there is always this underlying background of even as he is uh living as as a homeless tramp in in uh, London, that he could always just go back home and just be with his family and doesn't have to go through any of this. And like you said, it cuts both ways. I think for a lot of uh, uh, the British upper class, they didn't have any clue what was going on and to a certain extent didn't care and didn't even care after reading his work. But he was one of the central figures of that time period, of that time period. Uh, really kind of popularizing, like, this is what's happening among the working class. This is what our colonial empire is doing. So uh, he would continue living the life of various elements of underclass, uh, basically in and around England. He tried to get himself arrested and sent to prison, but he failed. Uh, He was only booked for being drunk and disorderly. But he did continue to spend days at a time sleeping rough, even if he could go home. Uh... He was working in the hop fields of Kent, doing domestic work at a lodging house. It was in 1932 that he took a job as a teacher at a school for boys in West London. Around this time, this is when he adopts the nom de plume George Orwell. First name, same as the king. Second name, same as the river. And uh, it's mostly to protect his uh, still respectable retired parents, I think. <laughs> At around this time, because I mentioned that uh, Burmese Days was technically his first book, but uh, the second one to be published, uh, we mentioned libel laws earlier, and Burmese Days was originally, in its original draft submitted to publishers, actually named the names of real people that uh, uh, Orwell both worked with and uh, were under the rule of the, the colonial empire. And the publisher kept sending it back to him saying i can't print this because we'll be sued if we do we can't actually print this because it's libelous to do so i believe he got published uh in america though before he got published in great britain uh yeah <laughs> at burmese days particularly uh but, speaking uh, of which just on on sorry, down and out of paris and london real quick before we move on Um, I mentioned that, like, you know, during his time as a Imperial police officer, he began to kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily, I I guess critique might be the wrong word. Uh, Certainly didn't have a kind of theory, but he had a moral inclination against what was happening. One of the things that starts to come out of uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, which is about his time essentially living as an impoverished worker in France and then essentially homeless in uh, London, uh he begins to kind of write about poverty in a way that actually starts to talk about it systemically. And it's very, very basic, but there's a section in Down and Out in Paris and London where he mentions that there was basically a policy among homeless shelters that they would only house and feed a person uh, once per day. I'm sorry, uh, once per day. And so what would end up happening is that if you were... A homeless person you'd have to keep traveling around to different shelters uh to get room and board and he notes very passively in the book that you know 
I'm seeing all these same people constantly migrating to different shelters. They have to, to get food. And how are you supposed to get out of this condition if you're constantly traveling for the next meal or the next, you know, roof to have over your head to not freeze to death? Yeah. Uh, he's about to get even better at it, I think. Uh, but just to move on with the narrative a little bit, in mid-1933, uh, he gets a bad bout of pneumonia that nearly kills him, uh, and it does kill his teaching career. So, uh, be because uh, libel laws, of course, in Great Britain would dog his career all his life, uh, Burby's Day is not considered publishable in England for many years, the so U.S. publishers published it. Uh, in 1934, he had to take a job as a part-time assistant in a bookshop. Uh, by the time he finally got Burmese Days published, he was still struggling to pay the rent on his flat when his flatmates moved out uh, until he quit all that in January 1936 and heads off to Greater Manchester to live among coal miners. Uh, and I really like this part. Uh, some of his best journalism, I think, comes from this episode of his life. Orwell writes very vividly of long, dark Passages that go for miles under the earth, ever smaller, more cramped the further one progresses. Of the stout, efficient, muscular bodies of the miners without an ounce of wasted flesh on them, he says. Contrast to the pudgy midsections of his empire's ruling class. Uh, he also comes into contact with some communists. Uh, he wasn't a big fan. Uh, I believe you have a little anecdote that you wanted to share about that. He also meets some British fascists. In that case, he was not just not a fan, actively repulsed by what he heard and saw. Uh, he also begins developing personal political philosophy in a more systematic way, I'd say, advocating for socialism and the challenges involved in his pursuit, or at least talking about them, as opposed to just being overridingly concerned, one might even say uh, fascinated in a negative sense, by poverty and injustice. Uh, as many a liberal will tearfully implore you uh, to recognize that they too uh, hate if you challenge them enough. And he really, around this time, especially when he was uh, going into the coal mines, he never uh, never worked in a coal mine himself because he would he would get too sick. But he would go down into then watch the workers. And he begins to realize that, like, if these coal miners just stopped, the entire nation would stop. The, the entire uh, capitalist system that kept keeps rolling on and crushing these people would stop and begins to realize like these are the people who actually have the power they just don't know how to how to use it yeah uh these are the same colliers that uh paul robeson will uh famously go and meet and uh he'll actually reappear in our narrative uh believe it or not uh because orwell and robeson had they're uh if they even if they never met as far as i'm aware uh they they had a run-in uh so to speak but uh anyway appreciators of his work from this period include not just uh you and me and uh his readers but also british secret intelligence who placed george orwell under surveillance in 1936 uh for all this talk of socialism uh, he also gets married around this time to uh, an Eileen O'Shaughnessy. Uh, everyone just guess uh, what nationality she is. You'll never figure it out. It's uh, a complete mystery. Totally. Nobody knows. To this day. <laughs> uh, Eileen probably wrote the poem that would inspire Orwell's most famous works, at least title. Uh, we'll revisit that when the time comes, but... His life and his writing are about to take another huge turn the same year in 1936 uh, when hundreds of miles across the ocean and the sea, Franco's coup came to be. The Spanish Civil War, of course, whose telling could fill 100,000 podcasts, was enthusiastically intervened in by foreign powers great and small. Among these was George Orwell himself, who left the United Kingdom that December to join the left-wing ragtag Republican coalition opposed to the conservative and fascist forces in Spain. That Republican coalition contained many liberals, Soviet communists, socialists, anarcho-syndicalists, and others. It would be plagued with factionalism. It's far too complicated to get into here in any sort of rigorous detail, but uh, I want you 
uh, not you, but you audience, to know that Orwell, of course, just first in line with the non-Stalinist Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. These were formed by some breakaway Trotskyists and their peasant and worker allies. Orwell would live to see this party brutally suppressed by Stalinists in Spain, which would affect his political consciousness even stronger than any hardship he ever witnessed in the lives of any coal miner or street beggar, I think. In a lot of ways, if uh, Down and Out wasn't my favorite book, Homage to Catalonia would, would have to be it, or at least it's my second. Uh, it's certainly a formative one, and I think everybody should actually read it at some point in their life. But uh, this details, uh, obviously, the, the Spanish Civil War, is, it's an incredibly complicated event. I don't want to uh, even jokingly kind of belittle this or that faction or, or overcomplicate the story. But it's very worth kind of exploring his thoughts on it. He, there's a whole lot of different stories in, out of this. I believe, I believe when he was serving, he was a part of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, if that was correct. Um, if I remember correctly. But this was, I uh, don't know. I do know where was, he was sent and when. Because uh, the Spanish Civil War as, an, as a historical event really kind of magnetic for a lot of radicals and leftists and, and frankly just fantastic writers out of the 20th century uh, a lot went there participated either as journalists or as uh combatants in one way shape or form and he details uh going through barcelona uh, when he first arrived and you know he's a quote machine out of this i'm just going to give one of my favorite quotes, and, and I'll try to bookend our discussion of this, this period with my favorite quote of his. But uh, going through Barcelona, he has this quote in homage to Catalonia. I have no particular love for the idealized, quote, worker, as he appears in the bourgeois communist mind. But when I see actual flesh and blood worker workers in conflict with his natural enemy, the policeman, I do not have to ask myself which side I'm on. And as he's traveling through Barcelona, he describes very vividly, like, this is the first time I'm seeing in my life working class people in the seat of power who have control over their own destinies. And they are reshaping society as they believe it should be, should be shaped. And he's really inspired by it. At first, I believe he actually came as a journalist, but then joined, uh, joined in with the cause against fascism. Uh, as far as I know, he, uh, after some, uh, a bit of trouble, like getting there, it was not important to get all the details. He was under the impression that he needed some papers officially from some sort of left wing organization in order to go there and fight. He did not. Um, but when he shows up and says, I'm here to fight the fascists, they say, uh, eventually, okay. And they send him to the Aragon front, which was mostly boring and crappy. His experience as a police officer, though, uh, he was very quickly made a corporal and getting shit uh, organized over there. Uh, after a time, his wife would arrive in Spain as well and begin to pay him visits, bring him gifts of chocolate, cigars, and tea. He actually got really super bored uh, of that, and he asked to be sent to the Madrid front and was told that that meant joining uh, the <clears throat> real communist uh, that is the Stalinist forces. Uh, he didn't think much of them, but for pretty much the last time in his life, he did treat them as potential allies, and he was sent to the Madrid front where he did actually see most of his fighting. But once that fighting was over, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, that was, of course, the, the party that he came to align with first, was vilified endlessly in the press by Stalinist communists as fascist collaborators and pretenders to the one true socialism. And then he saw armed gangs, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, armed gangs prowling the streets looking for any of his party members, including him, uh, the food lines, the crammed prisons, a general atmosphere of suspicion and anxiety as everyone was worried about being fingered, uh, either rightly or wrongly. Uh, he would obviously be extremely affected by this, uh, and he will go back to the Aragon front uh, just in time to uh, catch a surprise. But you, before I get to that surprise, uh, do you have anything to say about uh, that before I move on? Um, not 
terribly too much. Uh, well, you can just guess. I, you can always just guess what the surprise is if you want to. Well, I know what the surprise is. <laughs> I have the quote sitting right in front of me, actually. Yeah, he does get very disillusioned with uh, what he describes as basically the Stalinist and Soviet-aligned communists uh, within the Spanish Civil War. And again... It is a very complicated history. It's very difficult to uh, really summarize. And I want to kind of avoid getting too much into the politics of it because it's a little peripheral to this story in a certain sense. But he does get really disillusioned really quickly, especially after uh, essentially seeing checkpoints mounted all throughout the city and people being searched for papers, stripped of weaponry, things of that nature. Uh, Orwell goes back to the Aragon front and catches that surprise. It's a sniper bullet in his neck. Uh, Of course, the six-foot, two-inch tall Orwell had been warned repeatedly against standing up in his trench. Uh, he, He was considerably taller than most of the other Spanish allied fighters. The bullet missed his main artery by the slimmest of margins. The shot was so clean that the wound cauterized immediately, supposedly, so I've read. Uh, so Orwell basically spends time in a hospital bed at this point uh, and then lying low. Uh, and I believe has uh, most of his personal possessions stolen from him around this time, too. Yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, this is the be this is where my favorite line Orwell ever wrote. I think this is actually the I think it's the best line he ever wrote. Uh, no one I met at this time, doctors, nurses, practicantes, or fellow patients, failed to assure me that a man who is hit through the neck and survives it is the luckiest creature alive. I could not help thinking that it would have been even luckier not to be hit at all. It's true, and he was right. And that really sums up, like, him personally. Uh, he was very much like an Eeyore in the Winnie the Pooh-verse. This is now a Winnie the Pooh podcast. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm a total Tigger, and I'm here with Piglet. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, I was hoping Christopher Robbins, but, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh... While he's recovering, he uh, basically has everything that he brought with him stolen. He hides low, uh, hiding not from fascists, but from Stalinist communists before he finally gets back to England with his wife in 1937. He's actually tried by the communists in absentia for being a Trotsky stooge and fake friend. Uh, (laughs) He wrote uh, homage to Catalonia about all of this. Uh, this is more, actually yeah. this is actually the most misunderstood thing about um, Stalinist Russia uh, and the purges generally. Um, people like to think it's all like a political dispute or that Stalin was cleansing the ranks of political opponents or enemies. Really, he was just unfriending his fake friend. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it was. Uh, he gets badly sick again with some disease that I didn't write down. <laughs> In 1938, uh, hospitalized for several months before spending some more time traveling, basically avoiding the English winners in French-controlled Morocco when the Second World War uh, breaks out. Now, of course, uh, he's he's uh, OG Antifa, so he puts his name in for service, of course. Uh, his enthusiasm, Which they immediately yeah. deny. Yeah, and uh, he put his name in for service and never heard anything back. From them, uh, when he inquired further, a medical board declared him unfit for any kind of military service. But he was an enthusiastic participant in the British Home Guard and, uh, along with others, envisioned this uh, sort of this organization as a sort of glorious people's militia. If if you can believe it, uh, it's true. Um, this sorry. is also around the time. Um, this is partially born out of his experiences in Spain, but he becomes a hardline anti-pacifist. Because while a number of people, even socialist-minded and leftist-minded people, uh, were advocating for pacifism in the face of World War II, he, after his experiences in Spain, believed that what was coalescing out of Germany and to a certain extent Russia and Spain and Italy 
was something that had to be fought. And this is going to come to end around to turn him into somewhat of a cautionary tale. I'll, I'll talk about that when it comes up. But he begins to really argue very passionately against pacifism because uh, he just believes that in this particular scenario, when Nazi Germany is, is, is literally bombing the country, there's no place for it. You have to fight and you have to fight against fascism. He was particularly upset about the uh, temporary neutrality agreement between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany that took place in 1939, commonly known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact. This allowed Germany to turn uh, almost the entirety of its military attention to George Orwell's home country, something he took incredibly personally, I think. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, during the war, in addition to writing and commentating upon the writing of others and doing the home guard thing, he was also writing. This, is, this is when Orwell starts to feel like Stalin is a is a fake friend. Yeah, he also writes angrily in his diary about the sudden reversal that occurred in him when that neutrality pact was broken and Stalin became very quickly our friend again in 1941. He was very bitter about this uh, and the way that Oceania and uh, Eurasia or whatever the fuck in 1984 uh, constantly switched who they're at war with. Uh, this is exactly what he was talking about. But uh, shortly after that in 1941, he finally got some quote unquote war work. Uh, and his job was actually helping with broadcasts to India aimed at reinforcing the people of colonial India's loyalty to the English crown and countering Nazi propaganda aimed at the exact opposite. Also, uh, just a bit of trivia, honestly, he gets into a bit of a scuffle with H.G. Wells around this time when the two big dick writers got a little too big dick at the same time. Yeah, and this is where certain criticisms are, are going to start to bleed in and have a lot more weight to them. Uh, I really... I really do love 1984. I think it's a fantastic book. And uh, if you read about his time essentially working as a, if we're being blunt about it, a propagandist for uh, the British Empire at the time, he is using that experience to inform a lot of 1984. But at the same time, his hatred of Stalinism and Soviet communism uh, is going to start to bleed through into a lot of his relationships and a lot of people he worked with. And again, it's going to, it's going to get really bad in the end. <laughs> yeah. In the end, uh, actually neither him nor, uh, the people on the other side of the table will be looking very good, but in, uh, 1943, uh, before there was 1984, of course, there was another novel Orwell was beginning to work on called animal farm which today I think is a very excellent story for children, but not one adults should be too proud of reading deeply into, I think. Uh, but at the time it came out, it was actually a pretty sharp and poignant little morality tale that contrasted very fiercely with the moral ambiguities of his day and age when it was written and published. Now, by 1944, the novel was ready to go, but at least two publishers turned him down, on the printing at a time when the Soviet Union was still a crucial war ally. A third publisher did say yes, but this publisher got cold feet after he went and talked with an official at the British Ministry of Information. This guy who we talked to uh, is confirmed, has been confirmed to be a Soviet agent, actually, uh, who was extremely highly placed in the British Ministry of Information. I didn't write his name down because I didn't want to uh, burden everyone, but... Uh, you can look it up if you want to know more about that. Yeah, I, I, uh, we talked about this before. I'm not a huge fan of Animal Farm. I think it's a, I do think it's good. I think it's a good children's story. And uh, anybody who knows the basic history of uh, the rise of Stalin and, and the struggle between uh, Stalin and Trotsky and the fallout of Lenin's death can kind of see exactly what that story is doing. It has inspired some of the most obnoxious and tedious conversations I've had in my entire life. And I suspect 90% of the people who quote it in self seriousness are just dipshit assholes. I mean, uh, right wingers love that book too. Uh, <laughs> Cause it's, uh, 
on its face at least uh, anti-communist in a sense but this is not going to be a podcast about Animal Farm uh, we're going to move on from Animal Farm but uh, I think Animal Farm is worth visiting and worth reading uh, about uh, it's just kind of fascinating how every single element in that fairy tale uh, basically does line up with something from the real world or a blending of several things uh, from the real world and exploring that can just be a just be a good uh, portal towards uh, the world as it was in the mid 40s, I'd say. But uh, and I can guarantee that I won't be sending Jeff to a blue factory. By that's the right. Way. Oh. <laughs> uh, wh- oh fuck! Which animal farm animal did I say that you were? Hmm. I mean, you're probably a little bit of Orwell yourself. You're probably a little bit of the Benjamin, of the donkey, the cynical donkey. He's uh, smart like the pigs, can also read, um, but famously when they ask him in that book, uh, after the revolution, like the humans get chased off the farm, it's become collectivized. What do you think, Benjamin? You know, things looking up, right? He's like, life will go on as it always has, badly. <laughs> That's another line that uh, can actually sum up Orwell's life pretty well. Yeah. Anyway, before the war was over, his house was actually exploded by a German bomb. <laughs> Orwell himself scrabbled around in the rubble to recover some of his book collection, put it in a wheelbarrow, and cart it away. But we all know that Germany doesn't win the war in the end. At least I hope that everyone knows that. Now, his medical test failures had prevented him from being allowed uh, near any active fighting fronts, but after it was liberated, he traveled to Paris and later to Allied-occupied Cologne in Germany in early 1945, excuse me, which is where he was when his wife passed away uh, due to a mistake with her anesthesia during a hysterectomy. She had not told her husband about the surgery uh, because he fretted a lot about the cost of such things, and she was actually expected to make a speedy and easy recovery. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, But when she left this world, she also left, among other things, a poem entitled End of the Century, 1984, end quote. This contains elements of mind control and a police state that brutally eradicates all personal freedoms inside it. It was written a year before she met her husband, and it seems too fantastical to be possible that Orwell did not crib a bit from this poem and from his beloved wife. And so to her and uh, both he and we owe uh, a little something, I think. So uh, rest in power, Eileen. Rest in power. Yep. Uh, Just kidding. Uh, Silencing women's voices. I'm editing that out. <laughs> this is also around the time. This is around the time after her death, and uh, that Orwell himself kind of, uh, for in, in our modern parlance, we would we would begin to call him an insult. Yeah, um, I debated on even writing this down, uh, but uh, it came out years later. I mean, he was uh, he was impotent. Uh, they tried to have children. They couldn't have children. Uh, and they did discover why later. Uh, very tragic. They did adopt a child. Uh, but anyway, Animal Farm, whatever we would say about it, was a huge hit in Britain and worldwide. And it made Orwell much more famous than he ever had been previously. So around this time, he begins making several unwelcome marriage proposals to women much younger than him around 1945, 46. Basically any woman that was in the same room in him as him, because uh, he was mostly bedridden by this time. And so typically the women he interacted with were nurses and caretakers and, and uh, either taking care of him or helping to raise, uh, raise his son. And... I believe he proposed to three of them until I think a fourth one finally accepted. Uh, I believe there were four failed marriage proposals around this time. One will be successful, but it will come a little bit later, and I'll get to it. But um, 
Anyway, around 46, he moves to the Scottish island of Jura. Uh, sorry if it's Jura. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Begins setting uh, about to improving a homestead there and finishing up 1984. His housekeeper and adopted son joined him. This is funny, though. So when his housekeeper's boyfriend showed up, Orwell hated him. Orwell did not hate them because they weren't married and did not hate him because he was black or anything like that. Even though, I mean, he wasn't black, but didn't hate him because of his race or he didn't hate him because the boyfriend didn't like him either. No, the, the boyfriend was actually a huge Orwell fan, had been a fan of his writing for years. Nope, he was a card-carrying communist. And Orwell fucking hated communists. <laughs> So he treated this guy incredibly shabbily. So shabbily that they eventually like left after a few months. Couldn't take him anymore. Yeah, this is when his uh, hatred of traditional communists at the time, which were basically Marxist-Leninists of one sort or another, uh, basically became virulent. Um, it was occurring before then. But by this time in his life, it was virulent, and I suppose we might want to get to 1984 before we get to uh, uh, the topic you know is coming Well, about I'm that. about to damn near kill him off before we get to 1984, because honestly, 1984 comes out, uh, it, he basically finishes the writing when he's nearly dead, which I did not know reading that book, and did not know until I did the writing for this episode, and really puts a lot of that book in a different light uh, when you realize that it's basically being written by someone who's dying. <laughs> yeah, I believe he says at one point that uh, uh, he didn't think the book would turn out well if he wasn't dying. Or something along the... I'm paraphrasing a, a quote at one point. But he basically uh, credited the book's bleakness with his bad health and thought that actually made... I mean, it makes for a a very totalitarian, very gray sort of atmosphere. Um, I just it makes it, it makes it it just uh, makes it feel a bit different to me. In any case, because Orwell continued drinking, smoking, and avoiding doctors while also leading disastrous boating runs, <laughs> where he would end up quite soaked with seawater for several hours and nearly dying. He finally finished the manuscript for 1984 in late 1948 and was basically on death's door before being admitted to a sanitarium early 1949 where he will eventually die. However, doesn't he get married in that sanitarium? Or am that's I exactly what I was getting to. Uh, because before he does that, he will get remarried in a hospital room to a Sonia Brownell who uh, you may be thinking audience assuming uh that she was marrying someone much older and uh richer than she was who was dying for the obvious reason uh but it actually doesn't appear was a lying scheming manipulative gold digging bitch of any kind in fact she uh perry uh, was very sweet it was very certainly like kind of fluky that they married but she was doubtless a great comfort and companion to orwell in his final months of his life and all who observed her, even her enemies, noted that she always tended to George very diligently. Uh, many of Orwell's closer friends and scholars have remarked that the heroine of 1984, Julia, is modeled on Sonia. I have one quote here. Quote, the girl from the fiction department was looking at him. She was very young, he thought. She still expected something from life. She would not accept it as a law of nature that the individual is always defeated. All you needed was luck and cunning and boldness. She did not understand that there was no such thing as happiness, that the only victory lay in the far future, long after you were dead. End quote. These are the words Winston, of course, thinks on Julia in 1984, uh, who was probably modeled on a second wife. Uh, one of the crazier sort of human connections, I think, that have ever formed uh, between people in this world. 1984, like, it's always such a weird book for me, because I do really, I really love it. It's also along, it's also among the books that, like, I think is 
kind of yeah just cut this section too because it's not i'm having a hard time kind of conceptualizing where i want to go with that's right uh shortly before he died one of the women who had been the target of an one of those unwelcome marriage proposals by orwell uh, a couple years earlier approached him uh at this point she was an employee at the british information research department and what she said to him exactly isn't known but what is known is that as a result of their conversation orwell assembled from his notebook over the years a list of uh, what he considered either actual communists communist sympathizers fellow travelers devious homosexuals all considered unfit for one reason or another for association with the information research department now it doesn't appear that anyone on this list was ever uh you that this list was ever used beyond that purpose but generally Orwell could be very prickly towards anyone he's suspected of being a communist or a homosexual the notebook containing his thoughts that he based the list on was far far worse and it was a list or a notebook that he kept based on conversations that he did have with people and so it wasn't like he was secret about what he thought among his circle he called paul robeson in particular a brilliant musical artist political activist and friend of the show who had fought for the same welsh coal miners as orwell had an anti-white he called the poet and literary critic stephen spender a sentimental sympathizer with a tendency towards homosexuality charlie chaplin appears on the list next to the words jewish question <laughs> mark any thoughts yeah. on the list i'm sure yes uh yeah this is where i start to view him as a cautionary figure because as a teenager growing up i was as i said earlier which is very inspired by a lot of his writing a lot of his work but he is one of those figures that once you start to learn more about him and you learn about you know uh he, the the list he constructed and for what purposes it was used or could have been used it's where you have to start asking the question of okay is he still a good guy and at the same time you have to ask did his paranoia and fear of totalitarianism turn him into what he hated in a certain sense and like i was when i was reading up on this and i was kind of preparing for uh, to speak in this episode I had read some some article, I think it was in The Guardian, about this, discussing the list. And I don't remember who uh, who said this. But it was someone who was just kind of making light of it, saying, like, oh, well, all it meant was that these people couldn't be a part of, like, the British Information Services or something that, like that. Uh, they, yes, you're correct. The person who said that was the person who solicited the list from Orwell. Yeah. And... I think for anybody who like has you know half decent historical sensibilities about these things they know that's that's kind of a insane thing to say a uh, completely disingenuous thing to say and just to explain why you have to keep in mind that as you said uh you know he's tagging people for potentially being jewish uh tagging people for suspected or known homosexuality it's worth knowing at this time, uh, Alan Turing, who you could, you could write a whole episode on yourself or, you know, whole biographies have been written. We, the reason we have modern computers is partially attributable to uh, Alan Turing, who at this time was decrypting Nazi uh, messages to help in the war effort, was sterilized by the British government for his homosexuality. So this list isn't just a matter of like, oh, okay, they're not going to get a job at this one propaganda outfit. It could very well have potentialities beyond that. And even in America, we have our own history with McCarthyism and blacklisting and the complete ruining and destroying of people's careers and, and lives. I will say, for what it's worth, I, I looked through the entire list, quote unquote, which doesn't really exist. It wasn't revealed the existence of it until like 2002 there are anywhere from 34 to 39 names on it i looked into every single one at least a little bit 
to see if they were ever persecuted by the British government in any way. Um, I could find uh, ver like basically no evidence, at least that the list was used for any of that, for, for whatever it's worth. Now, I could be wrong. I Like, I didn't dig that deep, but I won't be able to know. Like, I did check. And if I had seen that, uh, like, some bullshit had been going on, then I would definitely be telling you this uh, right now. Um, I think what's worse about it is that, you know, like, this list, the reason she went to Orwell about it is because Orwell had been writing down and talking about his thoughts among his friends on this shit for years. And it isn't as if what he knew or suspected or guessed at, in some cases correctly, uh, uh, the person who uh, turned down uh, the publishing of Animal Farm at the uh, British uh, wartime information department uh who did who at the was at the russian desk uh did turn out to be a soviet agent and he was on that list and he was a soviet agent uh so you know he got one at least right like but the the real point is that like what what happened to these people in his notebook and on that list uh in the government is that, that like a lot of times they were put under surveillance uh, which if nothing else like is an abuse of power and frankly a waste of time right like no like they you know they never caught really hardly anybody it's the bullshit like you know it it's just like the fbi is running around like entrapping you know like poor black people or poor uh immigrants or like other non-integrated populations in america where the fuck like doesn't make them you know, a terrorist fighting force, right? Like, it's the same shit. Like, everything is always the same under the sun. <laughs> but, like... The yeah, I mean, you can, see a, you can see a silver lining that, you know... It, at least at first glance, it doesn't look like anybody's careers were, were wrongfully ruined. Well, just let me finish. That, like, might, that might be true. Just let me finish, because, like, they, they go to him and they because they know that he's already got a list in his mind and they want to put it to paper and they say it's only for this purpose. Um, and like, just because I can't find any evidence that that's true doesn't mean that like we can lean on that, right? Like this contributes to a sense of paranoia of na like this naming of names for political unreliability in a in a supposedly like free and fair society and he is about to die after he gives this list so who knows what he would have thought about afterwards but i tend to think that like this is not so much a turn hard at the end of his life as it is the logical endpoint of somebody who's obsessed with the sort of forces that he was obsessed with i think well, and that's where it gets into the question of, and I brought this term up earlier, uh, of him being a something of a cautionary tale for for leftists, because I do think he is a, a, a very interesting and uh, an inspirational. For, he he was an inspirational figure in me becoming a leftist as I was growing up, but at the same time, that type of impulse is something. I mean, this is the guy who wrote 1984, the book about spying on each other and ratting each other out to the government for various reasons. To have him be the guy that is providing a list, regardless of what it was used for, is a, it's an unfortunate irony in his life. And one, I think, that does turn him into something of a cautionary tale for people that uh, they should both look at the good points of his life and be deeply critical of other parts of it. The other thing I do want to make clear is um, the fact that he was approached by a woman whom had been the subject of a marriage proposal years before, just before he died, and asked to name names. It, nobody looks good. The government doesn't look any better than he does. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's outright manipulation. Oh, it, 
Oh, it's the worst, scummiest sort of tactics. You know, like, you know, this is something like mob bosses in like B movies do, right? Like, I'm gonna fucking, you know, like this is how I'm gonna like manipulate you, you know, into doing what I want. You know, I'm gonna send somebody to treat with you who you you can't say no to, and I know that you can't because you're, you know, an incel posting warrior with TB. Unfortunately, and it's like 1949 and you're about to die. Uh, anyway, uh, approached as he was on his deathbed by the person that he was approached by. It's possible that this, like, uh, to use the Americanized version, McCarthyite term, that he was making might uh, not have held. And if he had lived to see what the Ministry uh, or the Information Research Department, excuse me, uh, what got up to after this uh, and was all about, he might have had his regrets about producing a list for them. Uh, so say at least some of his sympathizers anyway, and I don't think they're totally unreasonable. Uh, others, I think, who uh, deserve credibility and uh, whose voice I want to make sure that I highlight is that, um, you know, there is a tendency to uh, uh, wave away a lot of this um, as never having never come of anything and, uh, you know, a problem of, um, a miscalculation of political philosophy, say, and, you know, nobody's political philosophy is, you know, probably, uh, totally without flaw of any kind, but, uh, I and they would also add that, you know, that's easy to say when you're a white straight guy. A lot of the names that are on there are, are named not because of their politics, but because they're immutable characteristics. Uh, because he thought they were gay, or because he thought they were uh, Jewish, <laughs> particularly. And he was particularly bad on this. Um, so, I think another lesson you got to take away from George Orwell is that uh, socialism uh, that puts class first um, and doesn't add anything on top of that. Um, is a failure. It will always be limited. It will never succeed. Um, I'm also class first. Uh, I think, like I said at the beginning of this episode, the story of the class of people who do all the damn work in this world and the class of people who order them about and the struggle between the two of them is uh, the, the fundamental story of politics in the world everywhere, period. Um, but I also think that you know, socialism for white people and socialism for straight people uh, well, isn't enough. <laughs> uh, it's less useful to talk about his anti-communist turn at the end uh, than to be the natural culmination of a path that was more and more concerned with authoritarianism to the point where even the mere whiff of it turned him into a snitch. That's what I think. Yeah, I think my button on it um, would be, I, and I, I suppose the button that I would put on it is that he, for all of his good qualities and, and his interesting qualities uh, as, a, as a socialist and socialist icon, he, I brought this up earlier, never really came at things with any kind of broader systemic critique he had he had systemic critiques but he didn't really think about things in, in super structural ways or super interconnected ways and what i see a lot as like rereading some of it as a as now that i'm older is his critique of capitalism and his, and his situating of the working class almost comes from a a kind of bourgeois moralism and it's that bourgeois moralism that's kind of the activating influence of a lot of his politics. And I think he takes it actually pretty far and into some useful directions. But because of that, and because he situates himself, I uh, believe he uh, describes himself uh, in Why I Write as fighting for democratic socialism and against totalitarianism in all its forms, that his moral critique of what he would term totalitarianism basically takes over everything else because he is concerned on a moral level with that over everything else. And I think that 
consumes him in a way that becomes unhealthy as he gets older. I mean, it's also true that he died relatively young and it's very, he was 48 when he died. Uh, something like that. Yeah. And you know, he, it, it is actually very possible that, um, you know, in a better world where he had been healthier or luckier and had lived, you know, he, he may have actually, uh, you know, turned back towards the light, uh, as we might put it. Uh, it's also true that, you know, if they hadn't sent who they sent, um, and they hadn't sent her when they sent her, um, in a, in a moment of supreme personal weakness, which like, you know, politics aside, we can, I, I can, I can see certainly why, <laughs> you know, this, this list being produced secretly at this time when, you know, he's almost dead, depending on who's asking for it is, you know, it, it definitely, uh, I, it's not, I'm not the saying, government knew what they were doing when they said, um, yeah, it's not so much that, you know, I would do the same, but you know, you have to recognize like, yeah, of course, like this is his, he's at his most vulnerable. Um, so, uh, whatever, uh, the future holds for George Orwell, uh, isn't known because he unfortunately died, uh, when he did, but his life, uh, does teach us a lot about, uh, socialism and democracy and, uh, the perils of, uh, putting an overemphasis <laughs> on, uh, anti-authoritarianism uh, because in the end uh, it does less than half the work for you uh, I appreciate you joining me Kentucky Fried Comrade I think you need to get back to spitting in some people's hamburgers I, there's only so much time in the day and I have only so much spit